think we start with Ali, um, who could share a bit more about just the context and what inspired you to do the work here, and you know what catch us up. What what moment in time are we visiting you in? Well, we're at the moment in time where we're really ready to learn from these amazing experts we have just heard from, uh, from a global perspective, as well as um, then bringing it into the realm of some really concrete examples of people who've been applying best practices uh, to their to local communities, and uh, so to two people are gonna speak to that after after I just give you a little background. Uh, I started the Local Food Alliance because I learned through impact investing and wanting to make change that food systems were extremely powerful as we've heard already uh, in so many different ways. Food systems affect your own individual health, so there's that individual driver. They affect how communities relate to one another and. To, people within communities relate to one another and the fabric of that community, they really allow for economies to grow and become stronger if you are supporting your local producers and um, preparers of food. And then of course the immense impact that how you source food uh, has upon the environment. And it really just, for me, was a way for me to rest more easily at night and feel like I was guiding my two boys towards a healthier lifestyle and um, a calmer way of looking at all the problems in our world because it, it can get really overwhelming. And just knowing how powerful it is to vote with your fork every time you eat, knowing how easy it is to have a, a really measurable impact on yourself, your community, and your environment, uh, just by how you consume your food. What, how does it, what packaging, like Kate referred to, the packaging of your food, um, and where, who created it, and really just understanding where it came from helps you feel more a part of a community, and there's all kinds of data that supports um, how much more of a active and contributing person you become in your own community when you're healthy and happy and feel part of that community. So Local Food Alliance was really a way when I moved back here after splitting time a little bit uh, between here and the Bay Area of coming back here and applying what I had learned to this community really as an effort to build something that others might be able to follow if if we were successful. And I quickly learned that the local in the name Local Food Alliance was really more about the people that we were endeavoring to benefit than it was about where the food was coming from. And um, just giving people uh, some visuals and uh, some bridges between where we have arrived in our global commodified industrialized food system where we've come to think that food should be cheap, it should be convenient, we shouldn't have to sit down. Um, we, we've really lost a lot of, of where food is most valuable through our insistence upon speed, convenience, um, access. So just giving people, uh, beginning to rebuild our food culture and help people understand uh, not just how powerful food is as a leverage point for change, uh, but also as a, a pathway to happiness, it's just as simple as that. And it really has been a joy for me to work with other people like Amy and her team who are working towards resilience to look at this community and figure out who we are and how we express ourselves through through food. We are an agricultural state, uh, Idaho is, and unfortunately, and this is not uncommon, 98% of what our farmers produce is exported, and 95% of what our consumers eat is imported. So that's it's just a little bit upside down. And we really wanted to uh, come together, teammates, who are here in the room and myself to help people truly enjoy local food on all the levels that it offers. And so we've been working in community solutions, whether it's enticing a local uh, elementary school to do a fundraiser where the kids are selling local food 
from local farmers, uh, or if it's um, building a coalition of stakeholders called the Blaine County Food Council. These are just a couple of community solutions that Local Food Alliance has um, brought forth in the last few years. And then we also focus on kids and schools. Um, if our schools in our county source more locally, then it's, uh, it's a little bit more bang for our buck. We get, we work with the school system, we help them source more locally, and we have a big volume uh, driving, uh, volume of demand. And so we also think that, of course, helping children learn earlier in their lives about the, the power of food is, um, is, is more beneficial than waiting and teaching, trying to teach them nutrition science, which has really never been that effective. So we work with children in schools, and then um, our third area is really outreach and awareness, and we um, publish a newsletter every month that tries to help people enjoy the local food with recipes and ideas and what's in season. We tell people what's going on in our community with local food, and then we do a lot of social media, which is definitely not my forte, um, and um, try and get the word out and just colorful pictures out and really just bring people to the table, literally and figuratively. So with that, um, we've gotten to know our community here and and really what's missing. And so locally and regionally, we don't, we can't grow a lot of what we want to eat here, but we can grow a lot of what we want to eat here as well. So beginning to look at what are our resources, um, where are the opportunities to strengthen our local food system here? And uh, we've really dived in and we've been looking at some solutions that other communities have um, have brought into play. I'm really excited to hear what Sam has to say about Vinder. And, but we also recognize that we need help. There's, there's a lot of work that's been done in communities like ours. So we invited Ken Meter to uh, come and work with about 42 stakeholders in May and uh, come up with some ideas, some what are the barriers, what are the problems, and now what, what are some ideas that we can put into play here in our community. So with Ken at the uh, facilitation level of that conversation, we're gonna continue that conversation later this afternoon in the working session, I guess not so much later, pretty soon here, um, and really identify the specific things in our community that will, um, make a more robust food system possible. So um, I think I'm just gonna stop there because I wanna give these other two people who've come to our community to share their wisdom and their experience do just that. So I think I'm gonna pass to Ken next, right? It's really a pleasure to be here. I, I have to admit though I'm not in my best today. I'm a little bit ill today. And if I come rash, if I come dashing out of the the room, uh, it'll it'll not be because of you, it'll be because I, I just have um, some illness that kind of took hold when I was on my way here, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, really at the national level as well as, as the community level because as several people mentioned this afternoon, food stands at the intersection of all the issues that sustainability encounters, and um, that that you know I actually started out doing sustainability measurement work in the city of Minneapolis and what I found out was that the food issue was much more immediate. It was much better able to connect with all stakeholders. And it was really, um, uh, you know, and it's very grounded in reality because we all eat and so we all can participate. I also found in my work that although the issues are global and national, the solutions will be at a community basis and they have to engage local residents in coming up with answers that are, that are appropriate to them. So that's my, that's my pitch today. I'm gonna to start with a map of uh, the places I've had a chance to work in the last 20 years or so. And I show this mostly because there are meetings like this in every uh, one of these states and more. And, and I, I got the chance to build a national network through the uh, auspices of the Community Food Security Coalition, which has sadly uh, died about 2010. It's really been a big loss in my life, but it allowed me to make connection very rapidly with people over the country. And, and I think that this is a, a remarkable map for just reminding us that 
this issue is breaking out everywhere. And I really, I've lived through several social movements in, a lot in my time, and I haven't seen one that's engaged so many people in every state so rapidly. So I'm really happy to be here. <clears throat> I, I like to step back and ask, what should a food system accomplish? And, and I think that we need to set a purpose for our food systems. We need to create them ourselves, as other speakers have mentioned. It's not going to happen accidentally, and the market won't bring it to us. Nobody but ourselves can actually design the food system we most need. So we want to look for a complex set of outcomes. We want to build health in our communities. We want to build wealth in our communities. We want to build connection with each other. And we want to build stronger capacity to know how to grow food, prepare food safely, eat food that's nutritious, and to really have those skills in, our, in ourselves. Um, uh, I also use the word local as sort of a shorthand because um, I really find that local food is pretty easy to be co-opted co by some of the folks who like to talk about local but don't really want the power to be local. So I'm actually much more concerned about building community-based food systems. Um, and that to me is the gold here. And I said this at a workshop we had in May, right in this room, and at the end of that workshop, people here said, yes, that's the direction we want to take. And I'm very thrilled that that came through to people here as well. This is how I define, define community-based food systems. It's food systems to try to build affinity between producers and consumers for the purposes of building health, wealth, connection, and capacity at the local level. This is both a purpose statement, a definition, but also starts telling you what are some of the ways to actually measure success? Are these things happening or not? And the more we can kind of find those outcomes really uh, loud and clear on our, on our horizon, we're doing better. Also, it's an economic case because I, I, I actually spoke with an economic developer in Oregon about 10 years ago. And he said, well, this local food is nice, but it's really sl small potatoes. Well, a year later, he had lost his job because there were no economic development deals to do in his community because no one was putting up housing, no one was doing strip malls. And because he was so off-putting to people who were trying to make it better, he actually lost his, his position. In many ways, it is small steps. I have one friend in Iowa who said, I've heard of slow food, but this is glacial work. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a really good way to put it. But at the same time, it's really at the fundamental nature of how we work together in communities, how do we Co collaborate with each other, how do we build social networks with each other, and how do we get the outcomes we deserve rather than choosing off a menu someone else designed for us. One example between the difference of a local food system and a community food system is that these oranges came, well, I found in a cooperative grocery store in Tucson, Arizona. They were grazed on a farm 12 miles from the co-op store. However, by Arizona state law, probably designed to protect certain large or orange growers, you had to have those oranges processed before they could be so sold. And the only processing that could happen at an economic scale was in Los Angeles. So you had oranges that were grown 12 miles from a co-op store. They were shipped to LA, they were processed, and then shipped back. To me, that's not local food. And it's, not, it's local in a sense, but it's really not community-based food until we have those processing capacities in our own neighborhoods. Uh, I promised to do a little bit of national data, uh, which is really grounds everything I've done. And I think it, um, in some ways, I focused a lot on economics rather than other issues, simply because a lot of the policy discourse, discussion we have is faced, uh, based on economics. So I really tried to provide some economic tools for local communities to used in negotiating their food systems. This chart shows the income and expenses shouldered by farmers since 1910 to about 2015. You'll notice pretty steady growth in income, but you also notice the input costs, the production expenses went up as, as fast as income. The red line subtracts those production expenses from the income and gives you the net cash income of farming. Can anyone here see sustained growth in agriculture in this country? A country that says we feed the world, that says that we really are the premier of agriculture? This system we've inherited, the industrial food system that others have talked about today, is not even working economically, yet that's the main justification for why we are saddled with it. But I want, I want to take this <clears throat> data and give a slightly different view of it. Um, it also turns out that the value of the dollar has diminished remarkably since this chart was made or since this, since this data was first collected. So um, I, 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 I take this data and adjust it for inflation. And this is a very interesting, different take on it. You see, first of all, that although uh, the, the, the orange line, I should, I should have said the orange line is cash receipts, 
and the maroon line is production expenses, and the red line is the net cash income. Um, when you adjust for inflation, you see that farming peaked in 1973, about the year that the agricultural economy became extractive to rural communities. There, that was not an accident. People were sort of pushed up by higher, higher prices to, to learn how to expand and try to take on new technology that perhaps was good for producing more food but was not good for their communities. You also see the, the production costs have risen in commensurately, but you also can see tell on the red line that we've had actually pretty good cash income in around 1916, around uh, 1942, mostly because we were loaning money to Europe so they could buy food from our farms. It was really an external price shock in many ways. Another one in 1973 when we were selling grain to the Soviet Union to get our dollars back after the oil price went up to what we thought was the unimaginably high value of $60 a barrel. And notice that in 2015, the net cash income of farming for all farmers in the country was negative. Even, you know, we're basically relying on external price shocks. Farmers farm hoping they will get wealth from those. Maybe they can sell their land for development when they're done farming. But it's really not a system that works even economically, which is the rationale we have for the farm system. Something else happened in 1973, and I think this is very interesting. The um, red line shows the use of high fructose corn sweetener. Notice how in 1973 it started to rise. The black line shows how much um, refined sugar was used. That held pretty steady for a while. The, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, br the brown line is the uh, refined sugar and the total sweeteners is the black line on top. So we replaced sugar for high fructose corn, corn sweetener, partly because we were convincing farmers to plant more grain at any cost. And that gave us a very cheap supply of sweetening, sweet of sweeteners. But also we noticed in that same era that the, the, kids, the kids in our schools were getting overweight because of ingesting high fructose corn sweetener and other lifestyle changes such as becoming more sedent sedentary and getting less connected to their food supply in the first place. And as those kids uh, aged, we have the obesity rates really rising quite dramatically, very much coincidental with our grain policy. So if you want a very good illustration of how our health relates directly to grain policy, this is a good one. Um, these are some of the projects I've had a chance to work on this year with my colleague Megan Goldenberg, who's a really brilliant agricultural economist who uh, is right now nursing her uh, two-month-old baby. So she couldn't be here. But if you want to contact us, you can find us here. And I'm, I, I, it's, it's allow, to the extent my health allows, I'll be here so I can talk to you more informally later. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for having me here. This is the first time I've actually been invited to speak at a forum, so I'm pretty stoked. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Allie. Um, I'm pretty shocked. As Allie said earlier, 98% of the produce that's actually produced here in Sun Valley is exported. But kudos to you guys. You're actually doing a lot better than Austin, Texas, where less than 1% of the produce that's consumed there is produced locally, according to their city's state of the food system report. Chemical ripe and produce truck thousands of miles away has become a standard of what we feed our kids. Local organic produce has become expensive, and farmers markets, they just don't always fit our work schedule. But there's this change happening. It's this movement where home gardeners and community gardens and urban farmers buy, sell, and trade with their neighbors. And that's what we at Vendor provide, is an online farmers market for them to do just that. Back in 2016, I found out that home gardeners often have an abundance of food that they can eat. Think cherry tomatoes, kale, apples, and oftentimes it goes to waste rotting on the ground or in their compost because they don't have an easy way to redistribute it back into their community. And for consumers, we pay a high premium for local and organic. It's between 7 and 82%, which is ridiculous. And we've lost this connection to our food system. No longer do we know who's growing our food how it's being grown, what's going into the soil, or even where. We might know the country, but we don't know where in that country. And so that's what we at Vendor help provide a solution for. We're a mobile app. It's an online farmer's market for home gardeners to buy, sell, and trade with their neighbors. It's free to sign up, it's free to sell, and it's free to trade. 
Exactly. So how's it work? Well, for home gardeners, you can log on to Vendor, post the items that you want to sell. You choose the quantity. You choose the price. We don't charge you. So you set $5 for a pound of tomatoes and they sell, you make $5. The buyer, like Anthony here, logs on to Vendor, finds the items he wants, adds them to his cart, checks out paying via Stripe, payment is direct deposited into the grower's bank account, minus our 20% service fee. Now, delivery, though, is handled between users. So customers, they can pick up the order themselves. They can meet the gardener, get a tour of their garden, learn how their food is being grown. And on average, you buy from someone who's within five miles of your home. The other option is to have the order delivered to you by the gardener for a delivery fee that's set by the gardener. We found that typically our grower personas are between 45 and 65. I say typical because millennials are happen to be the fastest growing gardening demographic, according to the National Garden Association, which I think is super cool. Millennials. Uh, so these growers, they work full time or they're retired. They've been growing for five years to 35 years. They always have an abundance, uh, like Charlie and Jude here. Uh, they have the best Padron peppers in Seattle, I gotta tell you. And our buyers are typically between the ages of 25 and 45. They work full time. They like buying local and organic, but don't always have time to go to the farmer's market. So they go to Albertsons or Safeway, because it's cheap, it's convenient. But as we know, the quality is pretty poor. They prefer delivery, but if it's close, they'll do a user pickup. This is actually at our demo day. We just got done with the Mass Challenge Accelerator in Austin, uh, and we we're showing it off. But Vendor didn't start as a mobile app. I'm really proud to stand here today because I didn't think I'd have this opportunity. I started it in 2016 on foot and bicycle in a small town called Port Townsend, Washington. Is anyone familiar with it? Oh my god. Wow, 10,000 people, average age 57. There are more deer than people. So I got the idea after attending a Chamber of Commerce meeting. I'd been there just six months. I was brand new and I had learned that one of the biggest problems in the community was access to fresh local produce. I was blown away, and so I walked home because I didn't have a car, and I saw this June of 2016, I saw apples growing in trees and all over the ground in front yard gardens, and I thought, why can't we buy from our neighbors? That seems reasonable and logical to me. So I walked up to a door, I knocked, and I said, hi, my name is Sam. I happen to be walking by, I saw you have an apple tree, you ever thought about selling your apples? I went, the hell are you doing in my yard? <laughs> Which I still get. I got this morning, actually, a few weeks, uh, a few blocks down. And I said, hey, if, if I could sell them, would you be willing to sell them? And they said, sure, why not? I can't eat them all. They fall on the ground and rot. And at the time, I happened to be working part-time behind the desk at a gym, folding towels and filling water bottles. Really glad I got a degree. Uh, but it actually made the greatest place because everyone that walked by that front desk, I said, hey, you want to buy some apples? You want some cherry tomatoes? First thing I sold was a pound of cherries out of my mom's cherry tree. Climbed in the tree myself. I packed a quart size Ziploc bag of cherries. I sold them for six bucks, one dollar cheaper than Safeway. Uh, I brought them home and I gave my mom five bucks. I kept a dollar. Business plan. And what that allowed me to do was create new relationships with my neighbors that I had never met. And it allowed me to know what kind of problems they were encountering and what kind of problems the buyers had and what the problems logistically I was having biking 50 miles a week. And so we launched this online marketplace. It was an online website to Port Townsend and people actually started using it. I was beyond ecstatic. And what we found was that the average order size, which was about this big, was 16 bucks. Yeah, homegrown, less than five miles, and the average time from when it's cut off the vine and in your hands is 30 minutes. What we found is the buyer retention was 77%. Grower retention was 90%. And we had a net promoter score of 74, which blew me out of the, wa out of the water. And now we launched it at Port Townsend, and at the time I was still behind the desk. I had this at this gym, the Port Townsend Athletic Club, for any of you who go there. And it grew. Through word of mouth, we had users, growers, buyers registering in over 90 cities and 19 states. And I thought, oh shit, what did I do? You know, <laughs> I don't know how to handle this, or I didn't. Um, 
but it really showed that there was this need outside of poor Townsend. This wasn't a problem that this little town was having. This was a problem the nation was having. And it, beyond that, I started getting emails from Argentina, from Spain, from Australia, from England. I was like, what? People around the world want something like this. So we launched the mobile, or we took everything we learned over those 18 months, and we developed the mobile app, which is launching September 1st, which I'm super stoked on, Android and iOS. Thank you. And so you might think, like, what is the real market of a home gardener, right? I wouldn't even think about it. Well, it turns out the National Garden Association says one in three gar uh, homes garden. That's 42 million people, and they produce an average of $600 of produce per garden per year, which makes in total a $25.2 billion market. But that's not really, we're not going to take it all, right? So let's just focus on guys like Ryan here. Single family home gardener, start off with a 600 square foot garden, or producing $600 of produce per, gar uh, per year. He sells about a third, so 200 bucks. Um, that creates here in Austin uh, about a just under a $20 million market. But Ryan here really enjoyed gardening, so he tore up his front yard, planted a whole garden, tore up his backyard, planted the garden, side yard, garden. Now, he produces $8,000 of produce a month. I thought this guy was an anomaly. Turns out he's not. I found three other gardeners like him within five miles. Nuts. So with Austin, what we're doing is entering these eight specific zip codes. We already have growers here and buyers, uh, but they also match our grower, buyer demographics and psychographics. And I got approval by the city of Austin to open up all 67 community gardens, which allows us to have quantity that's displaced without the community while creating new income for those community gardens to lower the membership fees so anyone can start gardening. And we host potlucks. We bring people together, the local chefs, the local growers, the local food bloggers, your neighbors, and we create this community connection that hadn't been there before. And we use this as a playbook to expand into our next six cities. And another really cool thing about vendors, you find variety. This is stuff you can't find at the grocery store or the farmer's market, like cucumelons, bite-sized watermelons that, or sorry, bite-sized cucumbers that look like watermelons, pine berries, White strawberries that taste like pineapple. <laughs> Atomic grape cherry tomatoes, pink lady kiwis, glass gem corn. This is the stuff that are growing in people's backyards. But we're not stopping there. It's a stepping stone. We're moving to produce or value added processed goods. Our goal is to be the largest neighbor made grocery store with zero inventory and zero delivery vehicles. And we'll plan on doing that over the next 12 months, which will bring our shopping cart value from 16 bucks to 77 bucks a week. Uh, we do have some competition. Uh, there's the farmer's markets, but we actually think we're a tool for them because these small farmers, they harvest. They don't know what's being sold. They take it to the market. We now allow them to accept pre-orders, have the market as a pickup location, so it reduces the amount of waste of unsold produce. Uh, Whole Foods, Safeway, Good, eggs, Amazon, they all use that uh, food hub model. Distribution center, high cost to start, delivery vehicles, labor, warehouse fees, cost companies like Good Eggs to pull out of markets uh, because that cost is so high. Uh, right near me, they like they have uh, it's an online marketplace that's similar, no delivery options, no payment options, no grower profile. They just show you what's growing in the area. It's awesome for us. And Oleo and Crop Swap are similar, except they allow you to sell like half-eaten jars of hummus uh, and extra. <laughs> Sandwiches that are in your fridge. Uh, so that was, there's an edit on this. But uh, 55000 is about what it takes to open up your community, kind of like kickstart it. And over the next 18 months, it'll produce 91000 in gross, and then two years after that, about $7 million. And that's all local. So what kind of impact does that make? Well, out of the 91, 73000 goes back to the community. That's $73,000 being exchanged between neighbors. And that's roughly 800 new jobs being created within the own, your own community. And roughly 29,000 pounds of food being saved that's no longer rotting in compost bins, as much as how awesome that nutrients is. This is our team. We're all gardeners. Uh, Mark, my co-founder, was actually one of the first customers when I was on bicycle. 
Uh, he's got 18 years of web experience. He shut down his company in April to start with me full time. Uh, so all of us are full time. Um, this guy's incredible. Uh, but what can you do in your community, right? Because that's what it is. How do we build a local food system? So if you're gardeners or no gardeners, sign up for vendor. That's step one. Step two would be tell people about it. Tell your networks. Post on social media. Three, go to our resource page. We have all sorts of ways to kickstart your community. We have 10 ways to do it. We have edible blog posts, edible press releases, photos that you can share. Anything you need, we've got. And you can give me a call. I'll give you my number, my email address, and I'll help you with it. In fact, afterwards, we can take a look at your city and we can create a strategic plan on how to kickstart it. And one of the cool things I'm really super stoked to announce is that we launched this WeFunder. It's in stealth mode right now. Um, but the reason to do that is, one, well, we need capital. Uh, two, it's the people that had this problem that kind of just showed me the problem. And it's the people, our community members, that decided to step up and actually create a solution and be a part of it. So I only find it right that they have the ability to enjoy in its success like we do. Without them, we don't have anything. And I think they should be able to own their food system. You guys should be able to own your food system rather than it owning you. So one thing we have to remember is you can no longer think of the farmer as some man or woman sitting on a tractor plowing acres of farmland. Farmers of today and of our future are growing food in warehouses, in shipping containers, in empty lots in the inner cities and our own backyards. Innovations in local organic agricultural production have skyrocketed, yet our distribution system has hardly changed. And vendors connecting these agro innovators and hobbyists with their community members to create a local feel on what will be a global scale. And in the, in the words of Wendell Berry, a significant part of the pleasure of eating is one's accurate consciousness of the lives and the world from which food comes. And with the future, that will be our neighbors. Thank you guys for this incredible opportunity to be here.